so in the later years, let's see that took you up to around age six-ish. Um, and I just wanted to mention too that when we went to see the specialist in Chicago, Dr. Dobbins, who's like world renowned for specializing in polymicrogyria, he told us when we asked the, you know, the infamous mortality question, that we would be lucky to see 10. And if we saw age 10 and he was healthy, then he'd probably live another 10 years. But beyond that, they really don't have any way of giving you any kind of a mortality estimate. Kids who are G-tube fed and have complications like he does, don't tend to outlive the parents. And basically he said, you can plan on him not outliving you. As awful as that sounds, that's kind of what we were told. So here he is going on 18 and um, he got on to Medicaid finally in like 2007 and we finally got nursing coverage to help because I was at my wit's end. I did it all for the first 10 years. and. 2007 he had his stomach surgery in 2009 he had another hip surgery on the left side it also came out of socket and then about a year after that he had a right femur fracture and that was out of the blue but it did lead us to realize that he needed to see an endocrinologist because his bones were demineralized and he was also kind of falling into, rolling into puberty time at that age, and he was developing a left lean. And at first it was just like a lean, he had a little bit of a lean, he was leaning to the side, like don't lean, but that lean was actually the progression of scoliosis, and it was getting worse and worse and worse. And so we were, and so we were monitoring that with orthopedic, and, you know, he told us uh, at some point surgical intervention is probably going to be necessary. But Daniel went from like, I don't know, 30 degrees to 90 degrees. By the time he was 14, he was about a 90 degree curve, which, you know, seated just like this. <laughs> And you can't correct progressive scoliosis in kids like Daniel with any kind of bracing or anything like that because it's just something that, that goes so rapidly. So we really went through a lot of thought process and it was so hard and so terrifying because um, spinal fusion is a huge surgery with the rods and everything. We met a really amazing surgeon out at Yale. We went through a whole there was a parent like training process. We went for our first meeting with the doctor where we just basically had an overview and he showed us a lot of befores and afters, spines, and he really was a, an amazing teacher and taught John and I a lot about what would be done um, for Daniel. And then Daniel sketched finally, well, he had to see the, the endocrinologist for a whole year. We had to put it off because his bones were a little bit too weak to hold the surgery and he started to do better. Scoliosis had worsened. Um, he was like leaning all the time and even the chair was like, it was, he was just telling him he was doing the letter C. So he had the surgery on December 3rd, December 3rd, yeah, December 3rd, 2012. It was 10 and a half hours long. It was terrifying. He was on a respirator for a little while. He had many blood transfusions. You know, he bled a little bit more than he should have during the surgery, but he he came out of it and it was Henry. And he was sitting up straighter. They got him right up. So, yeah. So that was December of 2012 and he was 15. So Daniel went through his surgery. He did remarkable, like we were just amazed. He was out of there in six days. They did. They discharged him. We had the hospital bed in here. Everything was set up so that the nurse had like the ability to uh, move him into the reclining wheelchair so that he could be positioned correctly. And we had everything here good. And even the Christmas tree was up and it was very cheerful. And it was really nice. 
and we were really just happy to be home and healing and then he just didn't seem well he could kept crying and crying and just just vomiting and gagging and we figured it was from healing from the back surgery so he was scheduled to go to the hospital on December 14th in the morning to have the stitches removed that was a Friday and on December 14th 2012 uh, we had an appointment at 1 o'clock. I had been up all night with him the night before because we were doing a lot of meds that had to be done during the evening as well, every so many hours and pain, pain pills and things like that. So the nurse had left and I had been up. And so I was upstairs sleeping in pills and things like that. So the nurse had left and I had been up. And so I was upstairs sleeping. Phone starts ringing and ringing and ringing. I'm like, what is going on? I heard my cell phone and, I, and it was Sarah, Mom, 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 Mom. You know, and then I heard the TV was on really loud downstairs and there was like helicopters outside. I remember that, like going over and over and over. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Um, Sarah had texted me, we're on lockdown. Something's happening at Sandy Hook School. Go see the TV. She said, I'm, I'm in lockdown and I think people are being shot or someone was killed or something's happening. And uh, we sat here in the living room staring at the TV. The, the therapist had come. Our therapist, Amy, had been here working with Daniel, who, who was like, Bleh! you know, he was really sick. I was like, I don't know what's going on with Daniel. Um, but we were so traumatized by what was happening. It was the, the shooting kind of happened at, at just a really vulnerable time for, for me and for us. But I had to call the ambulance anyway, and the ambulance came. And it was, it was, a little bit strange because we had two ambulances at one point because Yale needed to be called to have a special ambulance. Danbury Hospital, Danbury came by accident, or Newtown Volunteer. I don't know. Somehow, two hospital, <laughs> Danbury Volunteer, or Newtown Volunteer, and I don't know. Something happened. But we had two ambulances in our driveway. So, oh, my phone starts ringing. They thought we had something to do with Sandy Hook, and I was like, no, 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 Daniel. Down. So we got onto the ambulance. He just he couldn't sit into a car with that kind of a um, incision. He still needed to be laid down on a bed. Went up to Yale and saw the doctor, and we were looking at our phones the whole time, trying to find out what was going on. My kids are still in lockdown, right? So I'm going to the hospital to have the stitches out, and I think I really needed to go because I was also concerned about his physical state because he just didn't seem like he was doing well. The vomiting didn't seem normal. He, he didn't look good, he was sheet white. So the doctor looked at him and said, wow, he, he really should stay. And I said, look, doctor, I need to get home. My kids are on lockdown and they understood. And so they took a whole ton, crap load of blood work and tests and everything else, took the stitches out, cleaned them up, took us back home and I don't know. Then the whole weekend happened and the president came and all the media and all this. And it was, it was a nightmare. Uh, awful. But Daniel continued to get sick and sick and sick and sick. So Monday morning, really early, I get a call from the hospital and they said his amylase and lipase levels were through the roof, which basically means he has something called pancreatitis. Really bad pancreatitis. Um, and we were like, Oh my God, I don't even know what that is. He was very, very sick. So we got him back via ambulance to the hospital. They readmitted him. And that was December 14. Oh yeah. I'm losing my brain. December 14th, 2012. Two, well, two days later, we were readmitted into the hospital and we were there for 37 days more as he healed from this severe pancreatitis. And it was awful, <laughs> awful, because I was traumatized by what was happening in my town. My kids were fine. They were in different schools. They were not in Sandy Hook School. They went to Sandy Hook uh, School neighbors when they were school. younger. People the street were in the school. They lost yeah. their son. They, people up the street lost their daughter. I mean, it was just, <sighs> I, don't know. I don't know. It is what it is, right? Uh, we all know the story. So Daniel got better, came home, and unlike the year prior to his see the year prior to his final fusion, he had had 
severe pneumonia, like bad. And that's when the pulmonary team told me he probably is going to continue to go on a downward spiral if he doesn't have the surgery because the scoliosis is just going to compromise the organs is just going to compromise the organs and cause him more pneumonia and more problems because he aspirates and it's complicated he was a new child he was upright he was alert he was happier I mean, he was healthy and He's the poster child for spinal fusion, and I'll try to include some pictures. I've got some pretty remarkable x-rays, befores and afters, and stuff like that. So that was age 15. At age 16, we had a really big celebration, and, and we were really excited, and he was turning 16, and, and, and here we're looking at 18. So essentially, that's kind of Daniel's, Daniel's life story. It has been non-stop doctors, hospitals, doctors, hospitals, doctors, hospitals, sicknesses, seizures, surgeries, and then again, and then changes in meds and changes in, in status and just ongoing monitoring and ongoing follow-ups and equipment issues. I'm sitting in my living room, right? Looks kind of nice. There's a piano here and some sofas and stuff. But over on the other side is all Daniel's equipment. His stander, his wheelchair. His, his, I don't have anywhere to put all this stuff. But he needs to have it. So so he's turning 18. And where am I? I've been home for a couple of years with him now. Right? 10 years? I don't know. I forget it. 12 years? So that's sort of the history of Daniel. I know a lot of people have a lot of questions. You know, all the things that I could possibly do. I mean, he got a Make-A-Wish trip in uh, 2010. He swam with dolphins. That was amazing. <sighs> to make his life better, I have done that. Or tried to. I always feel like I'm not doing enough. I always look at him and I'm like, I'm missing something. There's something more. But all of the surgeries and all of the, the bone breaks and the, all that. He used to walk in a walker. We're trying to get him back up on his feet again. But it's very, very challenging. And that's kind of where I'm at today is uh, he's been going to therapy. You might watch the videos and you see him at this therapy where he's hanging and he's walking. They're basically uh, trying to facilitate his, his brain and leg connection to take the steps again. Um, and, and we're working really hard on that. And that's only going to keep going until the grant runs out that is paying for it because it's not something insurance covers. Because all the good therapies, <laughs> they're never covered by the... Medicaid so anyway you guys are awesome there's so much love for Daniel out there that I can't even I can't even it just overwhelms me like crazy this is a crazy journey it sounds so matter-of-fact but this is not the kind of journey most people I do everything humanly possible to encourage our other children to live their lives as fully as they can within our realms they've never slacked off they've never uh, maybe when they were little, when they were younger, you know, they used to get kind of frustrated. I remember we went to the um, the Mystic Aquarium once and they were not, or the, no, Norwalk Aquarium and Daniel was screaming and crying. Daniel's crying, you know, and it, it, they felt like everybody was always staring at them because they were, but they were really staring at Daniel, not he, at his siblings. But they love their brother too. They really do. And... The one thing this family has that's really strong is during all of these really intense times, everybody steps up. I mean, we spent two full Christmas seasons in the hospital. We had the one year in 2011 where he had uh, like pneumonia three times in a row. He was he was really really sick, and he had a, a, a pleural effusion where the fluid got outside of the lung, and then they had to put a chest tube, and it was, I mean it was a nightmare. So we were at the hospital for the whole Christmas season and the kids dealt with it you know it was kind of hard we were at home and then the next year he was having that pancreatitis thing we were in the hospital all the way through Christmas all the way through New Year's and the kids dealt with it they began to think well maybe we're gonna do all our Christmases in the hospital you know and they they got spoiled because the hospitals give out lots of toys and stuff to the siblings <laughs> anyway everybody always took care of us we had so much support uh, from community from friends from family so uh, but it's it's hard. It's emotionally debilitating, you know. It's 
don't even know how to describe it. You're just in a whole different world. So number one, I can find more ideas and more ways to help him. Number two, which maybe is more like number one because it's really amazing, is to just to give encouragement because there are so many people out there who who don't really have a voice or and that's okay. Not everybody does. I tend to be an open book. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, I used to do a lot of training and development. I used to really, really enjoy counseling people. So I love telling my story. I think we should all tell our story. But not everybody has that ability. And the amount of mail and, and messages that I receive every day from people, just, it, it makes me feel like I have a, have a purpose. Like for some reason, I'm, I'm developing and learning that there's a purpose for what I'm doing, and that is encouragement and, and and sharing love and hope. And there's people they thought that they were alone, or you know, I have a support group that I started in 2008 that has over a thousand members now. We didn't have anybody back then. I mean, 1998, 1999, there wasn't any information whatsoever. And and when Facebook happened, it was like. Oh my gosh, we have this tool, you know, which is so exciting for me. I mean, I saw the internet happen, you know, like for you younger people, you know, we didn't have all that. And it just opened up a whole, they have something at least to reach out to. And, um, Henry, Henry. <laughs> Henry is us. Any ideas, to us? Subscribe to Henry's channel. It's called Henry the Black Caton de uh, That one was just for fun because he's a black Caton de Tulier. And I'll explain that in his video. <laughs> Henry has a story too, but we're not going to tell that one today. So you have a nice day, and I love you all. Subscribe. Bye.